Beijing has ambitions to internationalize the central bank digital currency. It's going to eventually force uh, multinational companies uh, to transact uh, with China in that currency. And as those companies, those multinationals accumulate digital currency, China will have the ability to look uh, in real time at all of their payments, at how their supply chains work, and also to freeze their accounts if they don't like something that a company says or does that offends the interests of the Communist Party. Welcome to Post Corona, where we try to understand COVID-19's lasting impact on the economy, culture, and geopolitics. I'm Dan Senor. China's borders have been sealed for well over a year now, and those borders will be closed for the foreseeable future. That obviously is a result of the pandemic. But is there a larger grand strategy at play? For decades now, China's coupling with Western economies has been the dominant theme of the global economic landscape, really beginning with China's ascension to the World Trade Organization in 2001. But that's been changing. Fast forward to a speech by President Xi Jinping to mark the 100-year anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party. President Xi spoke before a massive crowd in Tiananmen Square. The Chinese people, he said, will, quote, never allow any foreign force to bully, oppress, or enslave us. Anyone who tries to do so shall be battered and bloodied, colliding with a great wall of steel forged by more than 1.4 billion Chinese people using flesh and blood, close quote. Hmm, a great wall of steel? On July 2nd, Chinese regulators announced an investigation into DD Global, a ride-hailing company. Think of it as the Uber of China. They announced this investigation right after Didi's IPO. Didi had raised $4.4 billion in the biggest Chinese IPO in the U.S. since Alibaba's in 2014. There have been similar moves against other Chinese companies listed in the U.S. Where will this go? Well, consider this. There are currently 244 U.S.-listed Chinese firms with a total market cap of around $1.8 trillion, which is equivalent to some 4% of the total U.S. stock market capitalization. Are we witnessing the decoupling of the U.S. and Chinese economies? Is this the one issue on which there seems to be a bipartisan consensus in the United States? Is the Biden administration cementing the Trump policies towards China or reversing them? How is China dealing with the Delta variant? And how will it factor into the Chinese Communist Party's next moves? Well, there's no better guess to help us understand what's going on than Matt Pottinger. Matt covered China and lived in China as a journalist for Reuters and then the Wall Street Journal. He covered the first outbreak of SARS there on the ground. Then, in his early 30s, Matt made quite a career change. He joined the U.S. Marine Corps with multiple combat deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan. Later on, Matt played an instrumental role in the geopolitical story of our time, reshaping the West's relationship with China, when he served as the Deputy National Security Advisor in the Trump administration, where he was the architect of the administration's strategy towards China. Today, Matt is regularly called upon from policymakers on both sides of the aisle to consult on U.S. policy towards China. As we enter a new phase of the pandemic— What is going on with the U.S.-China relationship, and how will it play out? This is Post-Corona. And I am pleased to welcome Matt Pottinger to the Post-Corona podcast. Hi, Matt. Hey, that's that's great to be with you, Dan. That's optimistic to call it Post-Corona. I know, I know. When we started this project, we thought it was going to be a limited series with a clear end. We didn't know exactly when the end date was going to be, but we certainly thought it would be by now. We are still aspiring to post-corona, but it feels like we are entering a very bumpy phase of (laughs) trans-corona. Right, exactly right. So let's jump into our conversation uh, about China, and there's a lot of territory that we want to cover But I just want to start first with where China is right now, just in the pandemic, just in the public health crisis, and specifically the the Delta variant crisis, because there's an avalanche of press coverage over here in the West about how we are dealing with the Delta variant. But there just hasn't been 
as much coverage because we're all focused on what's happening over here as to what's happening over there. So could you just first give us an update? Yeah, yeah. So look, China's got a got a completely different philosophy and approach uh, to COVID from from what we have here. They're they're suddenly facing their first crisis really since uh, they were able to eradicate the the original outbreak after they had covered it up for several weeks that seeded the global pandemic. But they they actually did a very good job of uh, crushing the pandemic within their borders. But they have a different approach. Our approach is very heavily dependent on vaccines. You've got something like 70% of American adults that have now been vaccinated. Um, China has vaccinated a lot of its population, but they don't have very effective vaccines. So their approach is really, you know, one of, of building a, the Great Wall even higher. It's, it's extremely stringent border controls using technology, surveillance technology and apps uh, and GR codes so that every single individual throughout the day is monitored uh, where they are, where they're going, who they've come in contact with. Uh, and they have been able to keep any major outbreak from occurring until now. And so they, it's like their their border defenses have been breached and they've got somewhere close to 2,000 reported cases that are uh, attributed m- entirely or at least mostly to this new delta variant so the delta variant's different the 2000 delta, yeah close to 2000 now inside of okay. mainland china um and they have rolling lockdowns uh that are taking place there have been cases reported in half of china's provinces um uh but they have they've jumped on this thing uh with with major lockdowns mandatory masking you know every everyone has a a red or a yellow or a green QR code on their phone at any given time that dictates whether they're able to move or not uh, out of their homes. And so you've got lots and lots of people under lockdown. Uh, travel is uh, is dropping, you know, reports of people who, you know, motorists are being stopped uh, as they try to drive between cities uh, at checkpoints and being turned back. Uh, air travel is dropping. They just announced uh, this morning that they've partially shut down the world's third largest container port, port because one of their workers um, had uh, a case of this. So, they, so they're facing a crisis again. But again, their approach is going to be dramatically different from ours. Uh, our, ours is, by default, we've had to learn how to coexist with this virus. And I think that's been true of most major uh, countries, uh, with the exception of some island nations that have, you know, Taiwan, Australia, mm-hmm. New Zealand have been very effective at, at just, you know, using using the oceans as a moat and and stopping activity long enough for, for these things to peter out with with big countries like ours and India and Europe and and uh, Japan and elsewhere. It's been it's been harder to actually contain the thing. So it's been more about mitigating the effects using heavy vaccination strategies and, and trying to coexist with the virus. The Chinese Communist Party has made clear that it has zero intention of following that kind of an approach. In fact, they've mocked democracies for the way that that we've handled uh, this pandemic. And they've made clear that they're going to have a zero tolerance approach. Um, that might work, by the way. It's worked pretty well uh, until now. You know, China is a uh, is not is not a typical country in this respect. They've got massive control over their people. They've increased the, the degree of control they have over their population thanks to COVID, um, and they're they are determined to completely eradicate this virus, uh, uh, even this Delta strain. I saw one market study that approximately twenty five cities have been currently tagged as, quote, mid to high risk in China, 25 Chinese cities. And if you look at those cities, they collectively account for about, you know, 12 to 15 percent of China's national GDP. Uh, How how big of a I mean, this phase that they're in right now, how big of a of an economic crisis? I know you said travels down, you know, um, you know, retail, entertainment, et cetera economy is sort of uneven at best. Um, is this, are, are they potentially heading into a real economic crisis similar to what we experienced in the first few months uh, after our first wave? It's it's definitely going to depress the economic recovery that hasn't really fully blossomed 
from the early 2020 crisis that they faced with the original uh, pandemic that emerged from Wuhan. So what what they're looking at now is is the political cost as the first priority. They 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 know that there's going to be a significant economic cost um, in terms of you know uh, a slowdown in in commodities trade and in travel and retail uh, that could that could. Uh, spark inflation, but they're willing to tolerate all of that because uh, the, the much more significant concern for the ruling party is the potential political cost if they uh, are unable to contain this thing. So they're willing to stomach some, some pretty steep economic costs in order to uh, eradicate the virus. And, and, and I don't think that that's all going to end in a month or two uh, when presumably they've managed to contain this strain again. Uh, they've, they've got a party plenum meeting later this year. They're hosting the Olympics, uh, the Winter Olympics mm -hmm. early next year. And then at the end of next year, next fall, you know, 15 months from now, they've got their party Congress that happens only once every five years. And that's, that's going to be the meeting where Xi Jinping, I, I expect, he's going to try to extend his rule for another decade. So they're not going to take any chances with a political and health crisis. They will take their chances with an economic uh, slowdown. So it looks like so it's unlikely that they'll reopen their borders in the near term. But 2023, you, I, I, you got to wait until uh, 2023, another year and a half before, for them to reopen the borders. Yeah, I think so. Why 2023? But they don't have a vaccine strategy that's going to get them to herd immunity. So this is the the most important defense that they have against uh, Delta strain and the and the strains that are going to follow, like Lambda, which is uh, uh, also a problem, also highly contagious. Uh, and so they're going to keep leaning on extremely stringent border controls as the first pillar of their defense. So then, so then, but to your point about the Olympics, so then, how do they actually host the Winter Olympics in twenty twenty two? Yeah, they're if, they're they're if building. This is their approach. They're building this um, uh, these chambers. It's like a, a you know a a, um, a bubble around uh, the sites where uh, athletes will compete. Uh, in some cases, they're not even allowing coaches. We're getting word that <laughs> coaches aren't even going to be allowed to interact um, uh, directly in some cases with athletes. Uh, certainly, they're not going to allow um, uh, spectators uh, to come. I think a lot of countries aren't going to be sending official delegations. They'll send their athletes, but they're not going to send official delegations because of the genocide uh, that's taking place in in the Xinjiang region in China's northwest. So it's going to be a really weird and spooky games. Uh, I mean, so it'll I, make the Japan Olympics we just went through, or the NBA bubble playoffs from the spring and summer. It'll make those look like freewheeling, totally, totally. open. And by the way, we got to give we got to give Tokyo its due. I thought that they did an amazing job under extremely difficult. Uh, situ you know circumstances and and with a lot of uh, skepticism by by a Japanese public that was worried about an influx of cases and so forth but they pulled it off I think they did an amazing job Japan did incredibly well in the Olympics as well we we, we did uh, uh, best with total medal counts and golds but Japan was I think in third place it was it was a pretty amazing so uh, event no, no, I, I, I agree. All things, uh, all things considered. Um, so in the opening, I, I talked about the tech crackdown by China right now, which is all the news, at least as it relates to China in the business press. But I want to, I want to take a step back and have you explain what kind of what, what is the bigger picture here? So, so during the first wave of COVID, our first wave, at least what we call the first wave, first quarter of, of 2020, Xi had unveiled a five-year plan. I think it was March or April of 2020, that you and I have, have talked about in the past. Can you talk about that five-year plan, what, what he basically articulated and how it fits into China's grand strategy that, in your view, is actually playing out right now? We're seeing it in this tech crackdown, but we're seeing it in other areas too. Like, what's What are they trying to accomplish? What's the long-term plan? Yeah, absolutely. So, so the grand strategy that was laid out in a couple of you know seminal speeches that Xi Jinping gave last year and then and then uh, institutionalized formally in the uh, 14th five-year plan that, that their National People's Congress um, uh, voted for uh, 
earlier this year. The, the plan is one of what I would call offensive uh, leverage and and decoupling from on Beijing's terms. Okay, so so Beijing often complains about decoupling the idea. from from the outside world. <clears throat> yeah, it, from it, the West. It, basically, in, in what what they want to decouple. It's a selective decoupling where Beijing has said rather explicitly that it wants its supply chains to be independent of industrialized democracies, you know, and in, uh, other industrialized countries when it comes to high tech. So, you know, the 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 industries that are going to be the commanding heights of this century, Beijing wants to be wholly self-reliant. Uh, they'll steal technology, but they don't want to have to buy it. They don't want to have to import equipment uh, and semiconductors and uh, and software from the West. They they want to have those things themselves uh, and and to be self sufficient. At the same time, they want to make sure that those other industrialized economies become increasingly reliant on China for those same high tech uh, supplies. That that is laid out explicitly uh, from the top leader himself in his speeches and in their. Uh, documents. Now, there's another component of this. It is that China wants to continue importing. In fact, it wants to grow itself as an importer of raw materials, fungible goods from countries around the world, and to use the leverage uh, that it that it acquires as a major importer of low tech stuff uh, in order to uh, advance its political objectives. In, in other words, to to acquire economic leverage that it can exert against those uh, exporting countries in order to achieve political aims that China's pursuing. So I'll give you an example. Uh, there's several, but one of the most uh, you know, poignant ones at the moment is, is what, what China's been doing to Australia. Uh, China, for the past more than a year, has been crushing Australian exports. It's, it's basically put uh, prohibitive tariffs and other uh, non-tariff barriers in place uh, that have uh, done damage to uh, beef exports from Australia, certainly seafood exports, wine, coal, not iron ore, incidentally, because China doesn't have another substitute uh, that could replace Australia as a source of iron ore. So it's for things that, that are fungible that China can substitute, uh, you know, imports from other countries that they will, they'll, they'll, that they're targeting uh, right now, and and then they they issued a list of fourteen demands to the Australian people, and the demands were all political in nature. It said that Australia has to stop allowing its press, to, uh, you know, it, it has to muzzle its free press. It doesn't want Australian press to be able to criticize uh, uh, the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, Australia has to give in to China's uh, excessive claims over the South China Sea, and so on and so forth. Fourteen of these demands now. The, the good news in this is that the Australian people have seen this for what it is, that this was an, this is an ultimatum that, that really would herald in a new era where uh, other countries, including Australia, would be uh, subordinate to China. So the Australian people have, have uh, re refused to give in to any of Beijing's demands, and they've worked to find new markets uh, for their, their exports. Substitution works both ways. You know, uh, you can also find new export markets for commodities, and that's exactly what the Australians have been doing. And so they're riding, they're riding through this uh, storm with uh, pride, and really they've set an example for the rest of the world. How has this grand strategy been informed by uh, Xi's interpretation of what led to the disintegration of the former Soviet Union? Yeah, so I, I think that it's fair to say that he's fairly obsessed with, and, and, and he's not alone in the Chinese Communist Party in being obsessed with trying to avoid the fate of the Soviet Union. So you had this, this incredible set of shocks that uh, buffeted the, the Chinese system 30 years ago at, at the tail end of the Cold War. Um, China had uh, experienced the Tiananmen protests in 1989, uh, that they put down violently. Uh, they then saw uh, the United States uh, defeat Saddam Hussein's forces, uh, leading a coalition in that in massively lopsided victory um, in 1990, 91. And then later in 1991, you had the collapse of the Soviet Union. So 
So Chinese officials began studying obsessively what what is it that they could do to try to prolong uh, uh, Chinese Communist Party rule at, at a time when the Eastern Bloc has collapsed, the Soviet Union had, had uh, collapsed. And what they came up with was this, this uh, threading of the needle, this idea that they would allow certain elements of, uh, of the market economy to uh, help boost the, the economy. They would, they would loosen controls over people's lives to an extent and also normalize the, the politics in such a way that um, you know, Deng Xiaoping didn't want to see a return to a cult of personality, Mao Zedong uh, style uh, uh, leader in China. So he ins instituted some norms like retirement ages. He made it more of a consensus driven approach, but he also had in mind all along the idea that once China was strong enough economically to confront the United States, uh, it would do so. And that's the moment we're at right now. That's the moment that became, you know, the fig leaf of, of hiding its capabilities and biding its time. That fig, fig leaf blew away um, uh, with the onslaught of the coronavirus pandemic uh, beginning a year and a half or so ago. Now, if you look at the grand strategy that you that you summarized earlier, you'd think that the reach of Chinese tech companies and the reach of the Chinese tech sector globally, not just in terms of ultimately reaching consumers globally, like say TikTok does, uh, and meaning not, not it not just being a, a domestic Chinese um, product, but actually something that, that reaches global markets, but also the ability to raise capital globally, you'd think that that would be a priority and for, for Xi and the, and the Chinese Communist Party. But, but you argue that they either subordinate that to political control, or at a minimum, they think that the way we see their moves in terms of clamping down on tech, and I, we'll get more granular in a, in a moment on, on what they're actually doing on, on the clamping down on tech, but I'm just trying to understand, do they think that they can actually control tech and control the growth of the tech sector without setting back the economy? <laughs> right. Well, the, their the, economy. Yeah, it's great. It's a great question. And of course, you know, the, the paradigm that we've all lived by since, uh, you know, the, the Deng Xiaoping era of reform and opening really took its fullest flight in the 1990s uh, up until China entered the WTO a decade later uh, in 2001. Which was what, 2001? Yeah, that yeah, was, it, they, they came in in December of 2001, so tw almost exactly mm -hmm. 20 years ago. And, and we thought that that would be the starting gun uh, for further reforms, that that was just the beginning. In fact, that was the finish line. <laughs> China had had completed all the reforms that it wanted to, to complete in, in terms of marketization and liberalization in order to get into the WTO and to take advantage of its access to uh, foreign capital and foreign markets. But then uh, they, they allowed the reform drive to stall out, and now it's moving rapidly in uh, full speed reverse. Uh, deliberately. And so this this growth before politics idea where we, we thought that China was always going to privilege growth uh, before anything because it's it, we thought that it's uh, the party's legitimacy was tied to economic growth. We now know that that's a delusion. That's not at all uh, how Xi Jinping is running China. He, he's putting politics before growth in everything. And that includes in the tech sector where um, you had powerful uh, wealthy entrepreneurs, and let's face it, China's entrepreneurial class, uh, a, a lot of it uh, was trained in U.S. universities and, you know, hung around in Palo Alto. And a lot of these guys um, uh, worked at Silicon Valley firms or at a minimum were backed by Silicon Valley venture capital. And, and some of that libertarian uh, spirit, uh, it, you know, rubbed off on, on that entrepreneurial class. Uh, that has really led the tech revolution in China. That is that is a big problem in the eyes of Xi Jinping and, and the party. They do not view uh, trustfully um, uh, that entrepreneurial class. And so what you're seeing now is a deliberate um, multi-year campaign that we're at the, at the beginning stages of, not the middle or the end yet. Uh, for the this party, is just the beginning. This is the beginning. They're they're going to assert their control over several sectors, beginning with technology, in part because they're worried about all of the data 
uh, falling into the hands of uh, foreign governments. They're worried about the data at the hands of um, you know empowered entrepreneurs in China. They want to control that data and they want to control those sectors. But also, Xi Jinping has a bit of a bias against. Um, what we term the tech sector today in the United States, you know, the, at least the part that you read the most headlines about, are are consumer facing apps. Uh, that that is not what Xi Jinping's vision for uh, you know technology is uh, moving forward in the 21st century. He wants he wants hard stuff. He wants yeah, he wants to make semiconductors. Uh, he wants uh, quantum computing. You know, less of a consumer facing uh, vision and and one that's much more industrial and and is tied to what he terms the real economy. Uh, he uses that phrase a lot that China must not turn its back on the real economy and and on uh, industrialization. So let's let's talk about where this started. Uh, by my lights, it started with uh, China, uh, the Communist Party clamping down on the online payments uh, economy, basically the duopoly of of Tencent, WeChat, and Ant Group. Uh, is that right? And and how how did the, that clampdown begin? Yeah, I mean, I think that was the seminal event that that at least alerted the world uh, about this campaign was the. Uh, the preemptive cancel, uh, you know, uh, cancellation of Ant Financial's IPO uh, last right. fall, and that had followed a uh, speech. And just for our listeners, this was an Alibaba company, Ant, the Ant Financial, right? And just, just, just try to put in context how big Ant and WeChat, for that matter, how, how big a role they play in in China. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, Alibaba famously, you know, started 20 some years ago as an e-commerce platform and, and grew to become, as you know, the Amazon of China. Uh, and Ant Financial was really the future of Alibaba. It was the, it was the finance components of the company that, that were actually outgrowing the original e-commerce uh, company because all of the payments uh, in China, we're going over the Alipay uh, platform and also uh, their competitor WeChat's uh, payment platform. And and in fact, the party had encouraged people using these kinds of payment systems because it creates data that's useful to the ruling party. They're able to see um, all transactions. They're able to 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 see each individual's uh, economic activity. Um, uh, but you know, they they also worried. That as the Ant Financial, as, as Alipay and WeChat Pay became bigger and bigger, that uh, it would threaten potentially the, the sort of uh, fiat privileges of the Central Bank of China. And so what they're really doing now is shifting to subordinate these private platforms to a government, a centralized government approach to electronic payment. And that's going to emerge um, uh, publicly at the Beijing Olympics in just six, six months from now with a central bank digital currency. So it's going to be uh, very different from crypto and Bitcoin and things like that, which are decentralized by nature. This is going to be a centralized digital currency that will give China uh, complete data over uh, all economic activity involving... So any transaction an average citizen makes using this currency, the government will be able to track. Not only will they be able to track it, they'll also have the authority uh, to freeze those accounts, um, uh, you know, to freeze currency if they want to at a keystroke. And that's useful for keeping uh, your own population in line. Uh, but also over time, Beijing has ambitions to internationalize the central bank digital currency. It's going to eventually force uh, multinational companies uh, to transact uh, with China in that currency. And as those companies, those multinationals accumulate digital currency, China will have the ability to um, look uh, in real time at all of their payments, at how their supply chains work, uh, and also to freeze their accounts if they don't like something that, uh, that a company says or does that offends uh, the interests of the Communist Party. So China suspends Alibaba's uh, efforts to, to launch the Ant financial IPO and then fast forward to what they what the Chinese Communist Party did last month with DD DD is China's version of Uber it has something like 
five hundred million users or some unbelievable, unbelievably high number. Didi was about to list on the New York Stock Exchange, and China did what? Yeah, in fact, they did list, um, even though there were signs that they were going to get into uh, um, a lot of trouble or, or already. Then I mean, the in signs trouble. were that they didn't get approval right. from the Chinese government, from the Chinese securities regulator to list in the U.S. That, that's just, right. When you so, say, that's a key point. They, when you say there were signs, the signs were they were supposed to get approval or they should have gotten approval and they didn't and they just proceeded. That's right. And and within a matter of days after they raised $4.4 billion, one of the largest IPOs uh, out of China. $4.4 uh, $4 billion from largely U.S. Yeah, investors. Yeah, it was, it was right. uh, on U.S. exchange, and it was U.S. investors. Uh, within a matter of days, the Chinese government announced that they were freezing uh, Didi's app. So, it, so Didi is the Uber of China. In fact, Uber is invested in in Didi. Uh, suddenly, Didi is not allowed to uh, disseminate its app uh, anymore. And uh, the the Chinese government incredibly also announced that they had moved the MSS, the Ministry of State Security, which is China's KGB, into Didi's offices. Uh, to to rectify the company and take charge of its data, uh, so um, pretty pretty incredible turn of events that j- happened just within a matter of days of them raising that money, um, and I, I think that 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 has really shaken uh, finally the market's uh, faith in the Chinese Communist Party to put growth before politics. It's that that delusion is now out there uh, in the open. And and it completely torched the value of a whole range of shares of stocks. Yeah, so gaming. I mean, Chinese, it's, it, Chinese it, stocks listed in the U.S. Chinese companies listed in the U.S. Yeah, as you look at at this campaign, as I mentioned, whether at the beginning, not not the middle or the end of this multi year campaign. Um, they're looking at all sectors, uh, and starting with the other technology sectors. They're looking at <clears throat> at gaming. Um, uh, it looks as though from party, you know, authoritative party statements that they think that, uh, video games are, uh, very damaging to the, the health and welfare of minors. Um, uh, and, uh, and so those stocks have taken a bath. Uh, China has essentially, um, pu- made public, uh, or, or, um, uh, you know, ended the private sector's. Uh, control of education. So, uh, they're, they're so let's, let's just, I just want to explain. So that's an important, that sector is, in China, the, the private tutoring, if you will, industry is a big industry. A lot of big companies, which actually attracted a lot of private equity and venture capital investors from the U.S. I just spoke to uh, an investor the other day who invests heavily in education, and he, in, in, for-profit education. He said China was the hot market. There was all this supplementary, uh, edu- there were all these supplementary education services offered to the Chinese market that were booming. It's something like a hundred billion dollar sector in China. And now China is, and the government is saying what to that sector and why? Yeah, that, that, that sector is now um, coming under state control. Uh, so Beijing does not trust private companies uh, or their curricula. Uh, it wants to control directly the the, uh, the curriculum of of uh, education companies, even tutoring companies. But also, remember, Beijing now recognizes belatedly that it has a demographic time bomb on its hands. Mm-hmm. The country is going to grow old before it grows rich, uh, and the one child policy has has now been turned into a you know first into a two child policy and then suddenly into a three child policy as Beijing tries to encourage people to have more kids. And one of the complaints that the party frequently heard was that uh, the high cost of education in China, and including private tutoring and the like, uh, is, uh, was, was an obstacle, uh, you know, it was a disincentive to have more kids. And so part of this is about leveling the playing field, uh, eliminating, uh, you know, competition in education and putting education onto a, uh, a f- fully into the hands of the state uh, a- a- in the hope that that might incentivize uh, a higher fertility rate in China. So that's part of this. And so so they've hit tech, they've hit, they're hitting gaming, they're hitting education, uh, as you said. 
What's next? Healthcare? Yeah, healthcare is an obvious one uh, that I think is going to drift into the crosshairs uh, because of all of the sensitive data that it involves, but also for the same reason that they've gone after uh, private education, that it's expensive. Healthcare is getting expensive. Beijing wants to control uh, healthcare prices much more actively. Uh, and so that that's an area that's uh, drifting into the crosshairs. Uh, property is a more comp- complicated one because property doesn't have. You mean just 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 residential real estate? You mean re- residential real estate in particular, even even more than commercial. Uh, there are a number of Chinese companies that uh, you've been reading about. Evergrande, for example, the second largest uh, uh, residential mm-hmm. property uh, uh, provider that that is massively um, uh, over leveraged. And so Beijing is going to look at, at property in, in a pretty hard way uh, in the hope that it can uh, diffuse this debt time bomb and, uh, uh, and, and mitigate against systemic risk to its financial system. Uh, but they're going to do that very carefully. They're going to do that more carefully than, than they handled, say, you know, the DD IPO or the Ant Financial IPO or, or the private tutoring and education sector. And that's because... Uh, everyone in China, you know, or a huge number, hundreds of millions of people own, own, property, own property in China. It's right. the only it's the only way that you can save money uh, or or mm-hmm. grow your wealth in China because uh, you don't get a return on on bank loans and you can't convert the currency to invest in stocks abroad. So uh, everyone's wealth and and uh, nest egg is tied up in property. So th- that's going to be real brain surgery for the Communist Party. On on education, the steps the the government took, the Chinese government took, were one, there could be no private, I think, there could be no private for-profit education companies. They all had to be transitioned to effectively non-for-profits as a structural matter. And two, they couldn't raise foreign investment capital. Is that where they're heading with healthcare? Because if, if the healthcare industry in China cannot attract foreign capital, that's like a really big deal for the global investing community that had seen this massive Chinese market as a place to deploy uh, a lot of capital. So, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I wonder from Beijing's perspective whether perhaps they were fairly confident that they were going to continue to uh, see a significant influx of foreign direct investment into China, even uh, even if public markets, um, you know, new, new IPOs on, on American uh, stock exchanges began to uh, falter. And, uh, you know, Beijing didn't seem to be all that concerned about uh, IPOs dropping off. Uh, and it may be that in part their confidence came from just the significant amount of passive investment that's been pouring into China uh, in, into its stocks and bonds uh, by virtue of index providers. So, you know, your MSCI and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, FTSE indices and uh, Bloomberg, Barclays and, and the rest have over the past handful of years, paradoxically, uh, increased the weighting uh, of Chinese companies on those indices, even at a time when uh, China has become much more opaque. The investment environment is more opaque today than it's, than it's been at any point in the last 25 years. Uh, there are almost no foreign journalists left in China. Uh, the, you know, the New York Times has gone from 10 reporters to one reporter. The rest have been uh, either expelled or, ha- or are having trouble getting back in uh, to China because of the COVID restrictions. Uh, so there's very little reporting. And of course, a lot of the domestic reporting, it used to be fairly freewheeling in the economic space in China. Um, that that's dried up as well. It's become uh, an occupational hazard to to write negative news stories about, for example, the Chinese stock market. So so at a time when we have less and less information about what's really going on in, in China's economy and and with its uh, companies, uh, these for, these Western index providers are are actually uh, weighing Chinese companies more heavily, and and that that's leading to a massive flow, tens of billions of dollars in new investments uh, flowing into Chinese bonds and stocks. So something like $2 trillion in Chinese stocks trading in the U.S. on, you know, on, on, on U.S. exchanges. 
and the Chinese government says their attitude is, you know, we'll, we'll live with the volatility or the or the or the you know, uh, evisceration of of value in those stocks. And by the way, some of some of that investment will just move to exchanges in China, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Shenzhen, like. That they'll they're just that's they'll the just plan. kind of roll with that, yeah. That's the plan, but of course, it, you know better than anyone that all of the rest of the world's markets combined are, are roughly equal just to the the scale and liquidity of uh, U.S. capital markets alone. So there really is no substitute, and I think they're going to learn that the hard way. Uh, but again, politics is the driving factor, not economics, right now uh, for uh, for China and its top leader. Okay, so let's move to foreign policy and specifically Taiwan. In your view, th there's a lot of noise um, and some sparks between uh, kinetic potential kinetic sparks um, between China and Taiwan. But what, in your view, would trigger a real escalation from China towards Taiwan? Yeah, I, I do think that the situation. Uh, across the Taiwan Strait is more dangerous than than markets are probably appreciating uh, at this point. Uh, the, ultimately, this is Beijing's ball. Okay, uh, Beijing possesses the strategic initiative for what happens next. Not Taiwan. Taiwan's not going to declare independence. The United States is not going to uh, 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 do something that would uh, would trigger uh, a crisis. It's really a question of whether Xi wants to follow through with um, the, the party's long stated goal of uh, quote unquote unifying uh, or reunifying uh, Taiwan. Uh, the Chinese word, by the way, Tong Yi, does not mean reunify, it just means unify. Uh, there's, there's a pretty good argument to be made that Taiwan, well, first of all, has never been part of the People's Republic of China, and, and Taiwan was part of the Qing uh, dynasty only very briefly. But uh, but this is a this is a paramount goal uh, for the Chinese Communist Party and for Xi Jinping personally. He's invested a lot of his personal prestige into uh, bringing it to heel. He's shown that uh, he's willing to fight and uh, to to uh, assert territorial uh, sovereignty. You know, he, Chinese. Military forces killed uh, roughly 20 Indian soldiers on their border uh, last summer. Uh, he's conducting uh, a genocide against his own people uh, in order to uh, uh, bring ethnic groups uh, in, you know, to heal in his northwest. Uh, this is the Uyghur, the Uyghur population. Yeah, the, the ethnic Uyghurs and Kazakhs and other traditionally Muslim minority groups, um, uh, and irrespective of whether people actually that are basically living in concentration camps. Yeah, no, quite literally. Um, so, yeah. mo well, well over a million people uh, in, in those camps, uh, and the, the the birth rate in uh, for those ethnic minority groups has uh, collapsed, uh, almost almost completely collapsed. So. And then, of course, Hong Kong, which was already part of China's uh, sovereign territory, but but Beijing didn't like the challenge coming from uh, Hong Kong citizens who were agitating for the rule of law and for democracy. So Beijing has has crushed that golden goose uh, without really uh, 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 much of a much of a afterthought about it. So it, I think it'd be. Foolish for us to think that that on Taiwan he's just bluffing, okay? And so, right. so what you then have to start analyzing are China's capabilities, and a lot of the focus has been on whether or not China and the People's Liberation Army have the amphibious sea lift that they would need to be able to conduct a successful invasion of Taiwan. Remember, amphibious assaults are uh, pretty much the hardest thing that you can do militarily. Uh, not easy, uh, but we've been looking very closely uh, at this amphibious sea lift, and we found that that if you only look at China's military sea lift, you know, traditional gray hull naval vessels, it looks like um, they may not yet have sufficient capacity. But then, when you start to take into account uh, the civilian 
vessels that have been uh, have been organized, trained, and uh, refurbished to be able to carry military equipment, um, uh, you you start to see a uh, a multifold increase in their sea lift capability. So it, we may actually be uh, pretty close to the point where they've closed that gap. Uh, and and we'll have sufficient sea lift to be able to uh, roll the dice on an invasion. Let's talk about the current administration's uh, approach, the Biden administration's approach to China. Um, so the American public, if you just look at survey after survey after survey, had been turning against, public opinion had been turning against China pretty consistently and pretty dramatically for the last few years, even before uh, Trump was elected president in 2016. And, you know, and then obviously things just, there were plenty of reasons for that public opinion to turn even more sharply, right? As China became ground zero for a global pandemic, as China was crushing political freedoms in, in Hong Kong, as is, as you've just said, as they're incarcerating hundreds of thousands, if not millions of its own citizens in, in, uh, Zhengzheng, um, you know, you just saw not not just in the U.S. In European number of European countries too. People getting uh, governments and the public turning against uh, China. So, the Trump administration, the administration in which you served, was at times highly criticized. I think sometimes unfairly for uh, being too aggressive in its approach to China. And there were sort of cooler heads were supposed to quote unquote prevail once the Biden administration came into office. What what has the Biden administration done differently from the Trump administration? I mean, the Trump administration imposed a number of policies uh, and made a number of moves against China. What what has the Biden administration changed from from its predecessor? Yeah, it's interesting. I think I think the most interesting aspect of the President Biden's first, you know, half year in office <clears throat> on foreign policy has been the degree of continuity on on uh, on China policy. So he, he didn't pick up where President Obama had left off. He really picked up where President Trump left off. And and I attribute that to, you know, um, you know, any any number of factors. I think one one thing is once you get into office and you start receiving a, a, a daily briefing from uh, the intelligence community <clears throat> and you, you start to see just how striking and malign Beijing's uh, intentions and, and activities are around the world, uh, including activities that are directly designed to undermine <clears throat> U.S. interests. Um, that that has a sobering effect, and I imagine that that may have uh, led in part to uh, President Biden's decision to maintain uh, after after a review period. He ended up maintaining a lot of the most um, pointed. Uh, initiatives that uh, that came out of the Trump administration, you know, the, the the tariffs. Remember, the tariffs that were imposed on China were designed to uh, incur costs for China's theft of our intellectual property. And China's theft of intellectual property has not abated. Uh, and so therefore, it makes sense not to remove <laughs> the, the one bit of leverage that we finally begun to build up. Uh, vis -a -vis Some of these tariffs, though, were seen as radical when Trump first imposed them. And I don't think, I mean, when well, I look, speak to people in the Biden administration, my impression is there hasn't even been like a National Security Council interagency meeting to even discuss removing these tariffs. Yeah, I mean, I remember, it's not even on their, it's on no one's agenda. You you heard uh, Cassandra's uh, crying that the sky would fall if, if the U.S. Uh, put tariffs on China. Not, not only has that not happened, we actually still have record trade uh, with China. Uh, of course, the vast majority of it in the form of imports uh, into our country, uh, even with those tariffs. So, um, uh, you know, the, the tariffs gave us leverage for the negotiations for that phase one agreement. And then, of course, the phase one agreement uh, seemed a lot less relevant in uh, in the context of a pandemic that's cost us several trillion dollars, and and which emerged uh, in in part because Beijing didn't uh, 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 didn't cooperate with us or or with uh, the rest of the world or with the World Health Organization uh, in in the, uh, you know in those critical early weeks of the pandemic. Uh, so 
you know, those are that's one area where President Biden is has held a steady course. Uh, another, of course, would be uh, the blacklist on investments. You know, there's a blacklist of companies that was devised by the Pentagon over the course of 2020. And President Biden has now handed the list over the Treasury Department to be the stewards of it. And, and that list was just a, a, a blacklist on U.S. investment in PLA associated companies. Yeah. But and... it's, interestingly, President Biden's expanded the definition to say that egregious violators of human rights also uh, could qualify for the blacklist. And once once a Chinese company is on the blacklist, it means Americans have to divest. They're not allowed to buy stocks or bonds uh, from those companies. So there are 59 companies on there now. I, I expect that over time that's going to uh, grow substantially, that list. And can, they've continued sanctions on individuals and entities associated with the, with the Hong Kong crackdown? They've expanded them. They've expanded okay. those sanctions uh, and so. continued pressure on TikTok and and other social Chinese social media. Well, it's that, interesting, that you know, plays the, in globally. The TikTok case is interesting because the, the, it got tied up in court, and the the Biden administration Justice Department decided to give up on the uh, Trump executive order that banned uh, downloads of TikTok, but. That's not the end of the story. There, Biden has moved forward with a Trump initiative to set up a, uh, a review panel at the Commerce Department to look at Chinese software and IT uh, equipment and, and to potentially ban uh, uh, apps and, and equipment and software on national security grounds. So you may find that TikTok uh, ends up uh, you know, uh, emerging in a different process uh, that that also leads towards some kind of uh, restriction. And it continued pressure on Huawei and, and other tech firms. I guess um, the big departures, you mentioned the WHO. So Biden is the, the administration is rejoining the World Health Organization. Also, the big departures, climate. So cooperation, trying to cooperate, at least with China on on climate issues, which I think you are skeptical that those efforts will go anywhere. Yeah, I'm, I mean, uh, you know, if, if Beijing cares about um, uh, a hotter climate and the effects that that's having, uh, then they'll 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 have an incentive to take action uh, on it. They're not going to take action because uh, we beg them to, or because we make concessions to them in areas wholly unrelated to climate uh, change. <laughs> Uh, and, and therefore, um, I, I don't think that we should sacrifice any interest in in uh, uh, pursuing, uh, uh, you know, a common approach globally to uh, to climate change. Uh, Beijing is is by far the number one emitter uh, of these uh, uh, greenhouse gases. Well, well over twice what the United States emits. Uh, it uh, is showing no sign of slowing down its reliance on coal, and in fact. It's funding the expansion of coal-fired power plants uh, internationally as part of its One Belt, One Road program. So you're seeing a huge increase in capacity of uh, dirty coal-fired power plants that China's building and financing uh, outside of its borders. So, yeah, I mean, do I think China is going to be uh, uh, cooperative on this? No. I mean, it's just not in their nature to be. I, I remember back in 2018, I uh, made an effort to uh, entice the Chinese government to work with us on pandemic prevention. I, I was thinking of uh, uh, the original SARS coronavirus, but I was also thinking about influenza because new exotic strains of influenza uh, usually uh, emerge from Southern China. And so China had not shared flu samples uh, with the WHO uh, um, in accordance with, with its obligations. Uh, and so I was, you know, working on finding areas where we could work together, even even as we had a contentious relationship in other areas. And and what better area than than you know, things like counterterrorism and and uh, pandemic control. These are things that are in our common interest. In the end, uh, Beijing w was uh, was not helpful, and I think it's because they determined that uh, that our interest in pandemic prevention. Uh, was a vulnerability in their eyes. Uh, 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 it was our vulnerability, and they wanted to leverage it to gain and extract concessions from us on other 
aspects of the relationship that had nothing to do with public health. So that's the way that Leninists think. It's just it's just the way that it is. You know, uh, you, you can't um, uh, expect a uh, Leninist uh, totalitarian system to be uh, extremely helpful and rational uh, when when we hope it will. Matt, before we wrap, uh, I last had on Mohammed El Arian, and at the end of the interview, he talked a little bit about his own personal decisions in life and career decisions, and it got a it got a, a tremendous response from our listeners uh, because he's he he made some pretty unconventional and contrarian um, decisions for a guy who was running, you know, Pimco, one of the largest asset managers in the world, something like two two trillion dollars of of AUM that he walked away from in um 2014. You yourself have had some pretty interesting twists and turns in your career and I just want to I, I talked about them briefly at the in the intro but I just want to spend a moment with you on it before we wrap. You were a reporter with Reuters and the Wall Street Journal from what year to what year and and you were based in China for part of that. Yeah, uh from 97 to 2005. Uh, I, uh, I, I worked at, uh, as a journalist, I, I spent, um, those, all those years in China, um, uh, writing for Reuters and then for the wall street journal, uh, and then, uh, left journalism, uh, in my early Hold on, 30s. Before we get to leaving, before we get to leaving, I just, one key point, you were in China working for the wall street journal during the first SARS outbreak. That's right. Is that right? Yeah. And has that in, that experience covering SARS for the Wall Street Journal during the first outbreak informed some of your thinking over the subsequent years on these kinds of um, epidemics, pandemics, and how and where they originate from? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, with the uh, the the two thousand and and uh, you know nineteen uh, emergence of a, a novel coronavirus. Um, and, and those early indications that China was not going to allow the WHO or the US CDC or others to, to come help uh, w- was for me, uh, you know, deja vu all over again. You know, I, I, I uh, w- was very much uh, informed by the, the cover up that China had perpetrated over its uh, epidemic back in 2003. And um, uh, and, and I was also informed by family members. I've got my brother is an infectious disease doctor in, in uh, Seattle, uh, and my wife is a, a PhD virologist who spent years at the CDC uh, and uh, continues to do uh, a, a lot of work on HIV and and COVID. Um, and so, I, you know, the, all, all three of those uh, resources, my own, you know, past informed by uh, reporting on SARS and then, and then family members helped, helped inform. And then that, that combination, late 2019, early 2020, you're in the White House now in the National Security Council, and you have all that perspective that's informing you. And while some officials and some in the media are playing down coronavirus, the, the COVID-19, you based on your experiences are saying, wait a minute, there's, there's something here. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it, over the course of January, I think there, I think the, the press was <clears throat> extremely complacent. Uh, uh, you know, I, I remember a lot of these headlines about how, uh, um, you know, trying to impose, for example, a, uh, a travel uh, restriction, it would be equivalent to racism and xenophobia. In fact, it bought us an extra month uh, that President Trump went ahead in late uh, January and decided to cut off travel from China. That bought us extra time uh, that we desperately needed. We needed more than we got. <laughs> and, in, and, and in the end, if Europe had uh, imposed a travel ban as well, I, I, think, I think we would have had far fewer deaths in both Europe and the United States. The virus really didn't come into the United States in a big way from China. It came in uh, via Europe, uh, because the Europe. So your Europeans, point is, had Europe cut off China travel too, then it would have it would have there been less spread in Europe, which then would it. have led to less. You spread got in it. The US. It came okay. in the back. It came in our back door, and we asked the Europeans to to uh, uh, follow our lead uh, in uh, cutting off that travel, and they they were uh, unwilling to do that. Uh, so lastly, just on your on your career trajectory, so two thousand five, you leave journalism. 
to do something that I think you are the only person I know of, that, or at least that I'm friends with, that left journalism to make this career move. Can you just describe what you did and why you did it? Yeah, yeah. There, there, there are a few of us, um, <clears throat> but, it, but it was an unusual move, I, I think. It was, uh, you know, I, I was watching out of the corner of my eye from China. I was watching what was going on in Iraq and, uh, and how the war uh, uh, that, that we got involved in there ended up uh, being of a different nature than what we thought it w was going to be. It was, it was uh, 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 transforming into a, in, an insurgency. Uh, and so, um, I, I was concerned that if we weren't able to salvage, uh, some kind of a decent outcome in Iraq, it was going to damage our, <clears throat> our, uh, credibility and our power elsewhere in the world. And so, um, I, I uh, am the stepson of a, uh, of an air force officer, uh, and, uh, my stepfather Vic had a big influence on me growing up. And so when I was, uh, uh, 31 or 32, I, I, uh, signed up for officer candidate school, uh, uh, in Quantico and joined the Marine Corps. Matt, we've kept you longer than, um, we said we'd keep you. So we'll, we'll wrap it here. I thank you for, for your service, your service to the country, not only in uniform, but also, um, what you did in government as a civilian, uh, over the last few years. And, uh, and obviously we, how, how you informed many of us uh, in journalism and continue to inform many of us today with your uh, public commentary and analysis. It's, uh, it's badly needed. You are, you are unique, a unique character in American public life, and uh, we need you to keep doing what you're doing. So I'm just I'm grateful generally for what you do, but also want to thank you for taking the time to help us understand some of these complex issues. And the bad news for you is we are probably going to ask you to come back at some point. <laughs> I'll keep pulling your ratings down uh, for what, <laughs> yeah. what, what is otherwise a really good show. And, uh, and uh, so thanks for doing it. Thanks for what you're doing to inform uh, audiences on a lot of important, complex stuff. Great. I will, uh, I'll, I'll come calling, Matt. You'll be back uh, on post-corona, <laughs> uh, unless post-corona actually comes, and then you're off the hook, uh, God willing. <laughs> thanks, Dan. That's our show for today. If you want to follow Matt's work, he's a distinguished visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution, a think tank at Stanford University. You can check out his published work at hoover.org. Post Corona is produced by Alon Benatar. Until next time, I'm your host, Dan Senor. <laughs>